Um, <coughs> to move from the, uh, the intellectual, academic, and sublime to the uh, to the slightly more uh, surreal aspects, there have been some interesting twitters coming in mm. in that conversation. Lots of references, probably, to the uh, to the digital equivalent of the condom and the relationship between air, airplanes and condoms. Um, and we're going to hold questions up until the end of the three sessions. Um, <coughs> Uh, so if you were banking a few at the moment, that would that would be uh, that would be useful. To carry on with the uh, with the Twitter theme, with your with your due consent, if you could all just smile, please. We, we must do the obligatory conference photo. You could you could applaud now if you want. That would be good. Go on, applaud. <laughs> Next speaker now is uh, uh, Matt Harrington from the uh, Government Digital Service. Um, <clears throat> Matt and myself have been doing a little work following the invitation that Mike Bracken gave at our summer, at our summer conference, our December conference. Um, Matt has sort of picked up some of that project and is, is going to talk to us about, about what we're achieving there. In, in essence, Mike Bracken was saying that he thought that Socketin was a great channel to exploit the digital assets of GDS. We had some conversations with him, a few people, Joss, Martin, Adrian Hancock and myself. Sort of spoke about where we might go with that, and we, we settled on a, on a project which uh, looks at the uh, the dashboard and the performance dashboard that, that Matt looks after in GDS. So we thought we ought to come and show you where we've got to on our prototype. Matt, over to you. Sorry, can we go back to this? Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Matt. I work as an associate product manager at Government Digital Service, um, and I work on a product called the Performance Platform. So, um, before I talk about that, Steve's already mentioned um, our product builds dashboards for services across government. Um, but before I talk about that, I thought it'd be useful just to give you a little bit of context and some background. So, this is how the services look across government by our latest count. So that's 766 services to central government um, and 1.43 billion transactions a year. Um, they vary massively. So sort of on the far left there, you've got um, stamp duty reserve tax, 399 million transactions a year. Um, and down there on the far right, you've got something um, which is a license to burn heather and grass. And there was just one of those last year. So you can, you can see the range of transactions and services that we're dealing with. Um, and they're also spread widely across government. So um, Biz has the lion's share here with 219 um, services. Um, and that small purple block in the middle is the Attorney General's office with just a couple. So why am I talking about this? Well, in 2012, um, the digital strategy was released. And in there, there was um, a clear sort of um, focus on digital by default. And by digital by default, we mean digital services that are so straightforward and convenient that all those who can use them will choose to. Now, that's going to be um, a big change. And to help with that, um, those of you who read on in the strategy will know that it refers to the digital by default service standard. So this is a service standard which all new and redesigned services which have over 100,000 transactions a year will need to meet. Now, we have a government service design manual, which is to help people through the um, iterative and agile process with, build, with um, building their new and redesigned services, but at the end of that they'll go through a service assessment. Now, this service assessment has 26 points, and this is um, a bit of the stick by which the performance platform operates. Um, I have to get a sticky note in somewhere, and that's uh, my own handiwork. Um, points 21 to 24 <coughs> of that assessment um, refer in particular to the performance platform and the four key KPIs for every transactional service across government. So they are cost per transaction, digital take up, completion rate, and customer satisfaction. Every government service reports that data already on the Transaction Explorer, and we're building dashboards to show that information. Now, those four KPIs are really useful to have across all of the service, services across government, but we think the, problem, the performance platform can help a lot more than that, that's really where a bit of the carrot comes in. So, 
this is our home page. Um, as you can see at the moment, it's a, uh, a welcome page and a link to a lot of the dashboards that we have so far. <coughs> the best things to sort of cover and tell you about what we can do differently um, and what else we can add value to for the service managers rather than just the four KPIs, but actually help them with data so they can improve and change their services, um, is to talk about some of our product principles. So we will automate data collection ending repetitive manual reporting. So our experience so far has been that lots of data is tied up in paper reports that get sent to boards, get sent to service managers. They're often pages and pages in length. Um, it's hard to find the bit you're looking for or it's not sorted. Um, by the time it's been collected, you know, it's not necessarily time relevant. So we want to automate data collection as best we can. Um, some of this includes getting live things from analytics. So for example, we can collect the live number of users on a site every two minutes, or we can get daily updates from databases knowing how many transactions have been done in the last day. So the service manager can see how their service is operating and how it's going, and they'll have that information live and available to them, much quicker than having to wait for something through email or asking for someone in a different department. We're also independent of any existing monitoring software, so we really don't mind um, where your management information is kept. Um, we work with everything from um, analytics providers to offline Excel spreadsheets. Um, we can combine data from different sources, online and offline, and show in a single place and a single visualisation. We're also doing as much hard work as we can and working with our designers to make things simple and easy to understand. So there can often be a lot of, lot of confusion with two people looking at the same graph. They might have um, a different view between what it's telling them, what it's saying. And to try and make that as clear as possible, we've gone for clear and simple visualisations where we can, with the right amount of information and contextual information that's needed, rather than overloading the user with stuff that's probably not always relevant um, to what's there. Um, we're there to provoke rather than replace analysis. So um, I've already mentioned that we want to automate reporting. Um, Lots of time is spent by analysts on churning out standard reports, um, submitting the same report that goes on a weekly basis, daily basis, monthly basis. Um, and we think a lot of their time would be better spent probably investigating why trends have changed, why peaks have happened, why there's been troughs. And part of that is to provoke the analysis. So this looks like um, a pretty standard conversion funnel, apart from you probably wouldn't be too happy if this was going into your shopping cart because there's a lot of people dropping off at the start. What this actually shows is the number of visitors to a stage in a transaction for um, making a lasting power of attorney. So what this records is the number of people who come into each stage in a week. Now, that journey can change and people can save and leave at any time and come back at any point in the journey. So it's not always going to be a funnel. But what it does show to the service manager is pages where people are repeatedly coming back to which could suggest they're struggling, um, the guidance isn't clear enough, um, the page is too complex, it needs to be broken down. The service manager can then make changes and they can iterate on their design and they'll see that reflected in the performance on the performance platform. Um, we're also open, open to government services, open to the public. Um, in a most basic way, that means via a URL. So none of this is password protected, it's all open to the public. So, gov.uk forward slash performance is our homepage. You can look at our dashboards from there. Um, and that's where Solihull One is also when we demo that in a bit. Um, our code is also open. It's available on GitHub. You can check out. And our final principle, and really our most important one, is to enable government, and in particular service managers, those people who own the service from end to end, to make decisions based on data. So our experience to date has been that data can exist in different parts of siloed organisations. It's not always shared. The service manager doesn't have what they need to make decisions and drive improvements in the service to make them digital by default, straightforward and convenient so everyone chooses to use them. And simple things can help with that. So this is an example of us instrumenting the help usage on the last one power of attorney transaction. So just by counting the number of clicks and the amount of people who were going through to a help part of the transaction, and then visualising that in a table, lasting power of attorney team and the service manager were able to see what most people were clicking on and looking at. Now that might seem like a small insight, 
but lots of people were asking about you know, reductions in the fees. How does that happen? How much does it cost? What if I want to make two lasting power of attorneys? Now, changing the journey so that the guidance is up front, or improving the information before you actually click start, is improving that for the user as well. They don't have to get seven stages in and then find out it's more than they wanted to pay, or seven stages in and they're not eligible. You know, there's, there's many examples of how sort of a small, simple insight can really improve that journey. A couple of slides from Steve. Um, So yeah, that's that's where uh, that's where GPS have been. That's what they've been up to with, with the dashboard. So we thought it would be kind of so so so. Where's the so what in that, if you like, for local? So I think what Matt's been demonstrating to you there is is the kind of maturity of the digital assets that the GPS have been putting together. So our now our, our challenge, and should we choose to take it, is so how does that fit in with locals? How do we exploit those assets best in local? So. That's quite an exciting challenge because there's all kinds of places we could go or nowhere. And I think that's probably you know, that's the choice we need to make. Um, so far, talking to people, there seems to be a great appetite for doing something with that. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at that challenge. And I can talk to you offline if anyone's interested about all the other organisations that are involved. Because when you go down this route, there's always someone who's started doing something like that already. So we're having those conversations with those organisations who are saying, yeah, how can we get involved in, in this way of making things? Things progress forward. Um, <coughs> so, you've got a click, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. so the um, <coughs> the kind of the big picture, if you like, is to say what we're trying to achieve here is to, in the centre there, we want to work with the uh, work with that digital dashboard uh, platform. Maybe it's shining up there, but it isn't. The work with that digital dashboard platform that's in the centre there, so that you know when digital transactions come in from local, they get presented on that performance platform, users use them. And the so what in that is partly about learning how to engage with digital assets, but so that we'll do other things downstream once we've done that. With knowledge rich, informed information led understanding, we can say here's uh, here's how we could develop other digital uh, transactions, other digital interactions. Um, and the way that we've done it is to say we'll do it a, a quick prototype <coughs> we deliver. We've done it with one transaction in one authority, and it happens to be Soli Hall with Miss Bins. Our next, our next step is to take three transactions from nine or 12 different organizations, and they've been all queuing up to say, yeah, we'd like to do that, please. And people are saying, I'm disappointed not to be included, which is a great kind of appetite to have. And then once we've done that, sort of release that to say, well, we've worked out how we can make it work, work out how we can deliver those, the data flow in an open way, and make it more widely available. We'll come back to some sort of, you know, in terms of a service manager or in terms of a citizen, how does that add value? We'll come back to a bit of that once we've had a look at it. So let's have a look at it. So this is um, a dashboard that we built as a prototype for um, Solihull um, Miss Waste Collections. Um, as I said, the, the URL is up there as well at the top, so um, by all means um, scrub that down. It will be available on our prototypes page later today as well. Um, but this is open, you can go and play with it um, and have a look around. So, um, the first thing we've got here is showing some information on transactions by channel. So, this is some information that um, Steve's team provided from Solihull, um, and you can see the number of people making. Um, requests um, for missed bin collections by phone, um, digitally, so that's actually completing the form online, face-to-face um, -face by walking into the contact centre or, or one of the centres around the area, and then there is also other. So other accounts for um, a few things in this case, we've grouped that together, for example, if someone um, sends in a tweet, um, my bins have been collected, obviously that then requires the council to um, start engagement with them, find out where, and while I suppose you could say it's, it's digital in terms of uh, coming in from, the, from a tweet, it's probably not the full digital process with them going online through the transaction. Um, some of the advantages of the platform as well, um, if you are looking at this and you wanted to send it to a colleague to say, look, we've gone down from 214 to 152 over telephone in a week, what is that? Maybe you want to play that alongside um, when the collections happened, what areas the collections were in. Um, oh, that's not so good. I haven't got an internet connection. Hopefully, I'll stick on this page. But 
what would have been nice would have been to go to our page per thing our page per thing module so you can just have us send a single URL for the graph and send that and share that and again because it's open there's no problem with sharing that with anyone usually you probably got the gist of that so I think we're, we're probably going to struggle on time a bit we'll maybe flip back on yep. the presentation Yep, if we can go back to the slides. Back to the slides then. So when we spoke to the service managers about, you know, so where's the so, where's the so what of that? What, what business value does that add? How does that help you run the service better? And who would be interested? So put that all up on the digital dashboard and everyone in the galaxy can have a look at it. Well, who's going through? Why? What benefit will we get from that? What will change as a consequence of that? So the way where we pitch this is very much in the in the, in the demand management space. So we're saying uh, there's a uh, report that comes out today around uh, do you do digital, which talks quite a lot about demand management. And actually, I think probably the the big emphasis in the e-government world was move it was channel shift. You want to move more transactions into digital, and that means you do the transaction for you know, pence rather than tens of pounds. Actually, if you can use digital to take up a demand completely, particular failure demand, a lot of misbins is failure demand, isn't it? Because you shouldn't miss them in the first place. So if we can actually manage out failure demand, it costs hundred pounds to go back and collect a bin, that's much more important than channel shift. So our service managers are seeing real value in this being a way in which to have a good conversation with an outsourced supplier, particularly a commissioning authority like ours, where we're saying, you know, we've got this contract and I can evidence that you're missing the bins. But more than that, so we have the in-cab technologies, we know when the bin wasn't presented and, and the, the, there's some dubiousness about whether the, the transaction was good or not. More than that, we're saying, actually, if you, if you look at a bin round, you'll find that there, you know, we, we, we consistently miss bins in certain locations. And that's often because of really bad architecture in an old state and the bins aren't very visible and people don't put them out. But when they don't put them out, they get cross with us. And we say, well, you know, the bin wasn't there, it wasn't well presented, couldn't see it, it was messy. And they say, no, you're just rubbish at putting out bins. We disagree with them. They phone the elected member. The elected member will inevitably side with their, with their citizen. We'll get it in the neck. It's a bad conversation. All spirals out of control and costs escalate. That's not a nice place to be. But if you're actually able to put up a map which says, look, it's green everywhere. These on a rag status. Most of, most of our, all of our bin collections are doing well, apart from this street, which you happen to live on, and that's where you're complaining. So let's have a better conversation about how you present your bin so that I can collect it properly, so that we don't have the failure demand, so we drive our costs properly. And as you know, when we started down this route, we weren't expecting to do that in, in this digital dashboard. It, you know, it, it, it became a discovery of something that we did as a consequence of this. And I think, you know, if we went through all of the 950 odd transactions that local authorities deliver and took them each one at a time and looked at them at that level of detail, we'd drive out other failure demand management and really drive down costs in, in local authority delivery. So I think there's something, you know, quite exciting to come out of this. Or we might just have been lucky. It might just only happen in this transaction. But that's the kind of, that's the, that's the game, really. It's an experiment. We'll do some digital things. We'll do them quick. We'll take them to prototype early and we'll, we'll work out whether it's worth developing further. So certainly what the, what the service managers want is more, you know, the desire is to see more of this. They'd like to see it done by maps. They want to be able to drill into it. Uh, they want to look at wards and streets and postcodes. Um, <coughs> they want to also, you know, there were some uh, best value performance indicators, which still have some currency, although they're not really being collected now. But you're meant to collect at least, you know, have, Less than 56 in 10,000 bins should be missed. If you're above that, it's red. If you're below that, it's green. So we should show that on the dashboard and then have that conversation and look at it, you know, relative to this council, relative to that council, have those sorts of conversations. It really focuses on the service delivery and quality of the service and that proper customer dialogue, which is a much richer dialogue and helps to take other demand, as, as we said earlier. So that's where we want to go. There's, there's, there's a bit of work to be done to get to be able to present maps on the dashboard. But the sort of thing, if you've used the police um, 
show crime in my area map is the sort of place that we want to go. There's a bit of work to be done before we can get to that. So we'll probably start off just by doing it in the next iteration. It'll be just in histograms. So you can see a particular ward street, maybe, that you can see here's, here's how it looks rather than in, in a map. But, you know, it's, a, it's an iterative, agile process, and that's the journey that we're taking. Um, we've got a few authorities, we've got those dozen authorities lined up to do the next phase, understand, work out which are the transactions we want to do next, and uh, see where that takes us in our journey with local and GDS. Is so there anything you want to add to that, Matt? No, I think that's, I think that's what we've done so far. Um, this has just been sort of kind of our normal process of work with a prototype, see how it goes, see how that works. Um, as Steve said, um, we're going to try something with a few more authorities and a few more transactions to see how that scales and to see um, if it works across a wider range of services, a wider range of transactions um, sort of with similar data sets um, and yeah, then see what, the, um, see what we can do in the longer term. Thank you very much. And again, we'll take questions at the last session just completing. Thank you, Matt. No problem. Round of applause. Thank you. Or we just want to go, no, we don't want to go for an early time. Excellent. <laughs> Question at the front here. As I said, it's important for the networking experience of Suffolk City as well we're here. So, good question. <coughs> Thank you very Hi. much. Um, Francis Burton from uh, Danny. I was just uh, going back to Matt and Steve um, and your dashboard. Um, and I was just interested to know whether you have any sort of waiting for unexpected events such as um, strikes or, or bad weather where things just don't get connected for weeks. Um, not at the moment is the answer to that. So um, we are not the canonical source of data, so we take data from departments and then display that. Um, we are still, if you're on our site, um, an alpha product, so there are lots of features that we want to add and, and develop. So um, we want to become a self-serve platform um, in the not too distant future, so people can come in, provide the data, get the data out themselves and, and get their dashboards. Um, but I think what you're talking about will probably come in what we want to cover, which will be the ability to sort of annotate visualizations um, and explain peaks and troughs. Um, that's quite important, the, uh, primarily for the service manager. Um, for example, we have one module which I didn't get to show you, which looks at page load time. It would be really useful to annotate when you're doing releases. So if that page load time goes up every time you release, you know, that's the evidence you need um, to talk to your team about perhaps um, some effort to sort of refactor some of the code on your pages to reduce the time that the user's waiting for the page. So I think it would probably come with annotation, but we don't wait any data. Yeah, so I certainly wouldn't want to do that from a local authority point of view, because really the data is what the data is, we're merely representing it. But we do want to provide a narrative to say, here's an explanation for why that why that data was the way it was. And they're absolutely right, you know, there are peaks and troughs in the data. We began the dashboard just after around, uh, we used data from Christmas. And you can see that there was quite a different trend and a set of experiences that took place just after Christmas than a month or two later. So yeah, absolutely, there are seasonal variations, indeed. Question at the back there. Um. Vicky Sargent from Boiler House Media and Soccer Team. Um, obviously, I've been working with Soccer Team Insights on um, uh, uh, gathering data for presentation, uh, exactly as you're doing. And you know, the difficult problem is actually gathering the data. Um, many local authorities um, will still struggle to um, to collect and have available the data from you know 700 plus or 900. You said, Steve. Um, different services, and I wondered if you'd um, got any comments on that aspect of the problem. So thus far, data gathering has cost Solely Health Council about two days of staff time, that's it. Um, the digital assets exist, so, you know, uh, manipulating and, and representing the data has spent a little bit of time, maybe three or four days probably tops, from the, from the GDS team. So it hasn't been a very expensive process to deliver what we've got because the principal is reusing the assets. Whether that, whether that experience then transfers to every other authority for every other transaction is, is, a, is a good question. And you know, it's, it's really hard to estimate exactly how, how that would go. Certainly some conversations early on with the LJ Inform, the LJ Inform Plus around using open standards and using um, URR 
you know, URIs to present the data in easily accessible ways. As authorities are going more and more for open data anyway, those two strategies kind of resonate, don't they? So you want to provide your data in an open way, and we want to access it from an open place. So it's hard now, it'll probably get easier as people more likely embrace more open standards and present their data in more open ways. Um, and this actually might be part of the incentive to drive that to happen. Particularly, you know, we've seen the authority next to me is doing something really good that I can't get to. I'm having a conversation with my supplier, my library management system, who's refusing to present the information. And I'm saying, but all your competitors are. I think, you know, just being open and transparent in that way drives the market a little. And we, 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 we may see some change to that difficulty that we all know exists there. But there's a question of just plowing through it and finding the easy ones and working out how to make the harder ones more easy, I think. Uh, Mary Foley from the Chartered Institute of Taxation, that well-known local authority. <laughs> is there any appetite or is there um, any desire to extend this to the third sector? Very much so, yeah. Um, and we we uh, chastise ourselves every time we say local authority because it's about pu local public service. There's a big appetite <coughs> to, to deploy this across the local public service, uh, local economy, if you like. So yes, um, third sector, yes, health. Let, yes, you know, right, right across. So, ab absolutely yes. We kind of want to get it started and then have something to show, and then be able to get that conversation going. Precisely when we do that might be, you know, in the middle of phase two or towards the end of phase two or halfway through phase three. Not sure. Um, if you want to come and have a conversation around how you want to do that, then that'd be great. I think from sorry, just quickly from our, our perspective, we work with Socketing um, on this prototype, um, which is. Data from, data from Solihull as well. Um, so the phase one or the alpha of the prototype has just been with one authority and, and one transaction. Um, we're committed to sort of doing this on a slightly larger scale with a few more authorities and a few more transactions. But in the background of this is that we would like to develop the platform so that it's self-serve. So, um, you know, some of those things with, sort of, with regards to it being open and people being able to come and play is probably a, a bit further down the line than phase two, but um, sort of we'll continue um, what we're signed up to at the moment, which is you yeah, have to try this out with a with a few more authorities, a few more transactions, then hopefully in a longer term future it'll be a case of push your data and then get yourself a dashboard. Question from from Mr. Cliff Evans. Uh, just linking the. Uh, two presentations together, is there any evidence either from Solihull or central government that uh, access to this sort of data is driving innovation in the organisations that, 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 that you're looking at? And if so, is that innovation targeted at increasing uh, digital take-up or is it targeted at increasing customer satisfaction? So, so evidential, empirical evidence from the first month and a half probably, <laughs> of presenting that data in those ways would be, no, I wouldn't say it had either of those consequential effects. We, so, but, but, but I do think that that's, that's part of the game. It is kind of, so it's a bit like, you know, we put the wheels on the, on the luggage. So was that innovative? In a way it was, you know, you know um, speaker of the back, Vicky was saying, we've been trying to do that for ages. So it's not radically new in concept, and I know the LJ Inform have been trying to do that for ages as well. It just happens that you know there is some maturity in the assets that we think we can do that in different ways now, which might just become a little, a little easier. So, so will that drive channel shift? Well, I'm not that interested in channel shift if I can get demand management. Will it will it address digital inclusion and social exclusion? Possibly, maybe it's part of the mix, but it's not a core driver. Will it make other innovative things take place? Probably yes. So it'll make more innovative conversations take place with citizens and that's probably you know as as important and is a frugal innovation if you like then what what we've demonstrated is a very frugal dashboard and it's about cultural change as much as about digital change within the, within the way you manage services and look after the, uh, the the outcomes that you're accountable for so i'd say say i have every expectation that the answer to your question is yes but i have no empirical evidence for it just yet <laughs> Matt, do you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, we, I mean, it, it's quite surprising. I think the example I gave you with the, with the help text doesn't necessarily seem like sort of the most groundbreaking uh, data to release, but that has changed um, how the online service is delivered, the information and advice that's given up front, um, and that's helped. Um, another thing that we monitor, which is completion rate. So, you know, um, making it a much clearer journey for the user um, makes it probably a better experience. And now, obviously, you can't link that directly, but if someone is having a good experience, it has better customer satisfaction and a higher completion rate, I would suggest if someone sees that, they might be more likely to, to have a go. But some of this is just about showing that data. So, for other services, there's been services that have been there for quite a long time, and just visualising that their um, digital take-up has remained sort of at the same level for quite a while is sort of that incentive to, okay, we've got good customer satisfaction, but our digital take-up is only at 50% or 40%. You know, it, it provokes that analysis again of what, what do we need to change to increase that? What do we need to change to get people using the digital channels? So. I'd be interested to know if, um, if, if Leslie has a, has a view on, on the kind of interaction, as, as Glenn was talking about, the relation between the dashboard and frugal innovation, whether, whether you, you kind of have a have an re immediate reflection from what you've seen in the light of what you're talking about? Well, yes. I mean, the, I, um, you need the, you know, any idea, any theory, you need um, evidence, you need data. So, coming back to your evidence. And there's a big thing about big open data of itself driving things. But I think the, the very interesting thing and useful thing about digital dashboards is actually getting people, A, to use them, but access. The danger is that fashionistas and certain politicians say, this is proof of innovation, this is all you need to do. I think the point about the third sector, in fact, our eGov for all creating a digital social economy is actually specifically going to look at the third sector of social enterprises as new forms of intermediary. But the, but the danger is that, um, yeah, that again, it's look to a quick fix. It's, not, it's, it's, it's the output. I mean, I think the demand management is the crucial element. The fixation, it seems to me, with policymakers is you have this stuff. It's like in the National Health Service. That in itself will transform things. And I think you know, the, the, the point was also made in, in regard to reversioning BlackBerry. It's that you know, getting beyond the, the particular firewalls and how you, how you engage people. I think the other danger is, though, that you can get lots of digital data about certain services because the baby whips of local authorities. But what's really missing, in the UK in particular, and the all-stop review of ONS data didn't look at, is socio-economic data on the ground. That's just as important. So, I mean, I welcome things, and I've looked at the digital strategy and the dashboard, but it needs to be aligned to other sorts of data and information, and actually how you analyse that in the demand management. So I think that's important. Politically, you can use this idea of frugal innovation because we're doing le more with less is a, is a tactical and political device I think all managers could use. Kind of building on that a little, we're talking through this through with Julian Bowery at the uh, Department of Community and Local Government. They kind of say, well, hypothetically, maybe, if there's a correlation, and there probably is, between repeated failures to collect bids and troubled families, that would be an interesting big data analysis connection to make. If that leads you then to be able to have early warning forecast indicators for, for <coughs> troubled areas, just simply by looking at your missed bin data, you know you might do some preventative work focused in that area around public health or around social care or, or whatever it is. If you're then able, able to focus your services in, in those ways, it might be able to you know, have, a, have a bigger, in, bigger innovative impact in the total big picture end-to-end process rather than merely looking down the silo of that data. So potentially things like that might, may emerge, but of course they may not, and it's an experiment, like all good things in digital. Uh, just quickly on that though, you'll be very careful, because DWP um, did some data and had a correlation between social housing and housing benefit. <coughs> Completely banal, it's not surprising. Yeah. It's it, but it's about actually those kind of, you like child estates, actually how you can improve them to improve people's lives. Yes. So that's the outcome. Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah. If you have those indications, then you can do something about it. Yeah. Time for last question before coffee. Just picking up on the, I know it's 
local government, I suppose, is still in its early stages, but one of the things you said was about changing the journey. And how are we going to, what lessons can we learn from central government about how your dashboard has helped your business managers and service managers change their journey and their approach to digital? Now, how do we engage with our, our peers in our business to get that same journey change? I suppose um, one, one of the best ways to do that is through our blog. Um, we talk about the experiences of the dashboards, people, what they've done with the dashboard since, how they've um, instrumented in their in their departments and what they've learned from them um, and how they've how they've used them. Um, so that's that's probably an easy way. Yeah, I, I think it's about just creating just it's about creating desire, not creating mandatory requirements. So if stuff is giving value and people want to use it, then they will. And if it isn't demonstrably giving value, then they won't. And if you can create the design and articulate it in a way which looks easy to access, then it's much easier to take people there. More of uh, Matt's carrot than Matt's stick, I think, probably. On that exciting note, we'll break for coffee. We're back, I think, at um, half past. Am I right? Is it half past? Someone's got a programme. We're back at half past, uh, and uh, I'll be uh, asking uh, uh, people to be back here at a reasonably timely way. But do enjoy your coffee, do enjoy your networking. The exhibition space is open, and uh, see you shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>